Great to be here, you guys. Uh, my name is Mike Marcellin, and um, for those of you that don't know Juniper, we kind of play at the intersection of networking and security, which I think is an interesting intersection to play in uh, in the discussion of smart cities. Um, I also, just as a side note, I don't think it was in the, the little intro, but I also am on the board of US Ignite, and for the last four or five years, I've been working with that organization, kind of a public-private partnership to help gigabit cities get off the ground as well as help them evolve into smart cities. So uh, I have a lot of interest in this, uh, in this topic. And you know, as w before jumping into the security problem, because I think it's one of the most interesting and challenging problems to solve in a smart city context, I wanted to just think about the broader journey that we're all going through in one form or fashion around smart cities. And it really starts with the first area, you know, the first application you deploy, where you probably have a business case, you've got some level of funding, and you're gonna go deep and try to get a level of volume to pay back that business case on your first smart application. Um, but really, I think where we all wanna to get to is where we have many applications. So you move from volume with a single application to a variety of applications. And so what I would encourage everybody to think about, and this becomes really important in a security context, is to think as early as possible, even with that very first application, think about deploying a platform. Or think about, you know, as you're deploying that application, what would I do to get to a platform as I begin to deploy additional applications at scale? So when you move from a single application to a variety of applications, eventually you want to move to a high velocity mode where you have applications talking to each other, working together, working back with a central repository, a central database, maybe it's your blockchain database, or maybe it's just you know, your command and control for your smart city. So this is the progression that we're all on, and you know, in, in order to be able to deal with this progression, there are really three fundamental components. The first one, connectivity. Sounds very basic, um, but when we're thinking about millions or, or even you know, billions nationwide of, of, of endpoints, connectivity becomes a real problem of scale to solve. Um, it's connectivity between entities themselves as well as back up to the cloud or wherever they may be communicating to. So connectivity is non-trivial, but it certainly is table stakes in, in a smart city context. The next one is edge computing, and I have a colleague um, speaking on this topic in another, in another track, but you know, in a nutshell, um, obviously pushing out more intelligence closer to the edge is gonna be critical for many of the, of the applications that we're talking about here. It's also, by the way, something that all the carriers are looking at as they're thinking about their 5G deployments because these things are, are intersecting in some interesting ways. But you know, solving that speed of light problem can only be done by pushing those applications out as close to the users as possible. So another critical thing that we need to think about as we're building out um, smart city infrastructure. And then finally, and the topic of the day uh, is around security. Uh, so that's where I'll, I'll dive in right now. So the security challenge, uh, as I talked about, is a very interesting one in a smart city context um, because it really requires a rethink of how we've secured networks over many years. And really the, the epiphany for, for me and, and, and us at Juniper a few years ago was just, you know, we have to assume that the network has been breached. Just assume that. And so if you start with that assumption, then what would you do differently in your security posture? And the reason why I say start with that assumption, it sounds like a very bleak assumption, um, but if you think about these endpoints, um, for many of these applications, they don't have the compute power or the battery life or they have other constraints that don't allow you to put traditional endpoint security, traditional even virtualized firewalls on those endpoints. So if you start from a position of, I'm gonna assume that I've been breached at that endpoint, now how do I lock that down and deal with that um, which is very different than how we've been building networks over, over many, many years. And so that's, that's the fundamental assumption that I want you to, to first think about as, as I go through this. And so we're all aware of the headlines, and these are all actual real headlines, and I'm not gonna name cities because some of you may be sitting in the room, but, but these are all public headlines over the last couple years about this issue. And I was reading up um, you know, some of the, some of the um, um, materials leading into this event, and it seems like there's a real bifurcation of opinions uh, in, the, in the context of smart cities and security. There's one faction that just says, smart cities are great, um, we have to go in this direction, let's go headlong, full speed ahead. And then the other is, don't go there because the security risks are too great. And it seems like we're having a challenge of kind of bridging that divide. And so hopefully um, some of this conversation will help us get there. But you know, there have been a lot of very high profile breaches 
Some of them, I would say, are dabbling, uh, meaning they didn't have a major impact, but it was more just to show that it could happen. Um, and some have been against critical infrastructure that we have to seriously pay attention to. But that's, what, that's one of the things that really sets smart cities apart from you know, the other security challenges that we face, maybe in an enterprise context, is the fact that we're dealing with critical infrastructure makes this that much more of a critical problem to solve. And so then as we think about, well, okay, so that's the, the, the city context, what's going on in the world? And what's going on in the world is daunting for any security professional or any, any company thinking about cybersecurity. You know, the, the most notable thing I would say is that, that the, the, the bad actors are extremely well organized and extremely well funded. And we hear about some of the nation states um, or just organized crime in general, but most of these are not the, the people in the hoodies in the garages just doing this for fun. Most of this is very sophisticated. And so as we think about how to defend, we have to be equally sophisticated. Um, that's why, the next point over, cybercrime will be an $8 trillion business. That's both the crime side and the defense side. But that's insane, that's massive. Um, and clearly that's a gate to any significant uh, smart city deployment at scale. You also have significant growth in malware that's being deployed, and many of that is taking the form of ransomware. A few of those headlines I mentioned were, were actually ransomware um, incidents where, where cities were kind of held hostage and they had to, to pay in order to allow their infrastructure not to be uh, further breached or, or held hostage. So that's obviously a critical uh, problem that we have to solve. One city actually, and I really appreciate this because it's hard to get cities and, and companies to talk about what they're doing to defend. But one city, this was actually San Diego, came out and talked about the fact that they have to defend against 500,000 cyber attacks every single day, um, which is massive. But I appreciate them sharing that and, and even how they're thinking about that because that helps us all um, you know, understand the, the magnitude of the problem but also understand what solutions are working. Um, there's been a massive increase in cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, and all of that um, with the backdrop of an expected growth over the next couple years um, in endpoints, we already are at 6.4 billion, and that's, that's a global number, and that's only going to grow. And so the last slide, which is depressing before I get to how we're going to address this, is, you know, all of you who run a city or run an, an IT environment within a city understand that, I mean, show of hands, how many people's budgets are increasing this year? Yeah. So you're dealing with a flat budget if you're lucky. You want to make progress and invest in these things that are going to make your city smarter or better for your citizens. Um, you have to care for security, you know that, but your budgets are, are, are flat. The other challenging metric is that um, the estimate is next year globally there will be a two million person shortage in cybersecurity professionals, which means we don't have enough. It's great if you're a cybersecurity professional. It's certainly a seller's market, um, but, but it's a challenge for any of us who are trying to figure out how we secure cities at scale. And then finally, you know, we think about you know, IoT and smart cities, but we also know that every city has an, an entire IT infrastructure supporting all of their applications. So whether they're smart or not, they have a massive infrastructure that's quite disparate, and you have to think about securing all of that because that, uh, that vulnerable endpoint is not just an on-ramp to your critical infrastructure, it's an on-ramp to all of your applications and all the data that you have behind that. So you know, managing that is quite challenging. So okay, got a firm grasp of the problem. Now let's see if we can figure out some solutions. This is what we hear from everybody. Um, with all of this going on, threats are changing, my budget's flat, my personnel is, is challenged, my skills are, you know, I don't necessarily have all the skills I need on my team, I can't keep up with all of this going on. So we really need to look at this differently, and I think to get to the different solution, it's instructive to think about where we've come from, from a technology and security perspective. So back 20 years ago, uh, or maybe even a little longer ago, maybe 30 years ago actually, when, when the first LANs were created, first LAN was, uh, that I'm aware of was created basically to connect computers so that they could print with a massive printer in their, in their office more efficiently. Um, and that was because printers cost a lot of money and all of that. Um, but the point was you had a very closed environment. So it wasn't connected to the public internet, so it was very easy to secure that. And even as you started to connect those LANs to public internet um, resources or just the public internet in general, you could do that pretty effectively with just securing the perimeter. If you keep the bad guys out, you know, you can assume safety within, within and so firewalls were born. Um, and that's become kind of a mainstay for all of us. A funny thing happened when we got mobile and you had people starting to come and, and uh, come into the, into the workplace 
um, uh, with mobile devices, and certainly in a city environment, everyone is mobile um, and potentially accessing your resources. You have to care for that in a different way, and so that's how endpoint security really took off. Um, but again, as I mentioned, with IoT, you don't necessarily, you certainly don't have a, as defined of a perimeter, um, and, and you uh, also don't have the kind of compute resources on the endpoint to be able to do um, endpoint security, at least in some cases you don't. And so in this world of the cloud, things sitting in the cloud, smart cities and IoT, um, you have to start thinking about new ways to solve the problem. And so, by the way, you notice there are pluses on there. That doesn't mean the old ways go away. Um, certainly, you have to use your perimeter security to defend yourself as best as possible, and it's great against known threats. You have to use endpoint security, certainly for your personnel and staff, but you're not going to be able to deploy an endpoint agent on every one of your um, citizens' uh, devices. So you have to think about new ways to attack it. So if you're playing buzzword bingo, you may just win here. I've got big data, machine learning and automation, and blockchain from the last session, so I think we've got our bases covered. But actually, it's really important. Um, because as I said, the, 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 um, the, the attackers are extremely sophisticated, extremely well-funded, and they're leveraging all of these techniques. Why big data? Well, the interesting thing about the network infrastructure, and I said that Juniper plays at the intersection of security and the network is, the network kicks off a huge amount of data. And that's data on what that network is seeing, the applications that are flowing over it, the users that are on it, and every single breach, every single piece of malware, every attack traverses the network. And so if we can leverage data from the network to understand what is normal and what is anomalous, I mean, your network has a fingerprint, and that fingerprint is your traffic, your data, your users. And so there's a really powerful use of big data in this context. The next is machine learning, because obviously, and I'll talk about machine learning and automation together, you know, you have to leverage these techniques to stay out in front of, of, of the attackers. Um, not only do we have a shortage of cybersecurity personnel, but just to keep up with the volume of attacks, you need to do that. And then you need to learn as you go. Uh, and so these are all critical elements. And I, and I tell you, the bad guys are using them. So we have to get smart about using those. So let's talk about then how do we get to this, this new world. I've already mentioned that perimeter and endpoints isn't, endpoint isn't enough. We need to move to pervasive security. And you know, I talked about the fact that every breach or every piece of malware tra traverses the network. The solution that we are uh, um, bringing to the market or, or approaching this problem with actually uses every point of the network as both a detection and enforcement point. So yes, firewalls, yes, endpoints, but also the entire network infrastructure. Again, why is that important? IoT, you assume you're vulnerable, and in many cases you just are because you can't defend. Um, when that IoT device connects to an IoT gateway or a switch, probably not directly to a firewall, if you can lock down the threat at that moment, you stop it from propagating throughout the rest of the network. So this is really important to have pervasive security, not just in security appliances or devices. The next one, and this is uh, something we're seeing ac across the board in the entire industry, is moving from just hardware to more software and cloud-defined. And I'll talk about how that works, but we need to leverage the, the, the lessons from the cloud and the capabilities that the cloud can bring um, to give us a bird's eye view of what's going on in the infrastructure. Manual to automated, I've touched on that. We need to move from configuration oriented to user intent. Again, a shortage of personnel means we have to make things simpler. And if we have to define every situation in every use case, um, we can't keep up with the unknown attack that's coming our way. And then finally, um, and this is critically important as well, we need to move from closed siloed overlays. You know, I, I'm sure all of you work in very heterogeneous environments. Your network's heterogeneous, your application set is heterogeneous, certainly your users are heterogeneous in how they access the, the infrastructure. So we need to move to much more open, uh, standardized approaches. So these are kind of the tenets of our approach. So let me show you how it'll work with, with a, a use case. So imagine you have surveillance cameras, just as one use case in many, many cities. That's one of the first uh, applications that they deploy. And imagine here comes the bad guy, little bad guy coming in. So imagine now your surveillance camera has been breached. Now sometimes you may have some type of security um, capability sitting on there. But in, in the old world, if that comes in, that may propagate your entire network before it lands into a security, uh, purpose-built security device. Uh, further, again, they're not just necessarily trying to cripple all of your surveillance cameras, although they may be doing that, but they also may be trying to get your data. Uh, the personal uh, data that you have on your, um, on your citizens or um, you know, any 
any kind of financial data, all, all of that kind of stuff is fair game, as well as other critical infrastructure that may be connected to the network. Um, so if this is the entry point, you know, the sky's the limit on what they can, what they can attack. So let's talk about how it will work a little differently if we employ some of these techniques that I've talked about. So threat still comes in, and by the way, the surveillance camera is still vulnerable. So again, assume it's vulnerable. But immediately, when, when we see that something has come in that we don't recognize, we can bring it over into a cloud-based kind of sandbox, if you will, and very quickly, within seconds, determine um, is it something that we know about and we can quarantine it or shut it down. If it's not something that we know about, we also can run it through its paces. So we can actually use machine learning and some, some discovery techniques to determine, hey, this may be something that is bad. Let's make it think that it's making progress. So we can actually spoof that, unlock it, and see. And all of that just takes a matter of a few minutes. So now we've automated the detection of you know, malware that we didn't even know about before, that our firewall couldn't stop because it didn't know about it. It's a new piece of malware. Um, and so all of these things we hear about WannaCry and Petya and not Petya and all of these pieces of malware that have wreaked havoc, this type of solution stops that in its tracks. We also have centralized policy and control. So once we identify that it's an issue, we now tell the entire infrastructure. So we can lock that down at the first point of entry onto the network through the automation that we have. So that's in a very quick nutshell what we've done. I don't think I have time to go through um, a, a, an actual use case where we've got this, but I'd be happy to, to you know, speak with any of you offline or at our booth. I did want to say, though, that that specific demo that I just showed in great slideware is also running at our booth, so we can actually show you how that works uh, in the real world. Um, and just an example of how you can use the entire network, automation, the data coming from it, um, and, and some machine learning to get out ahead of the bad guys. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.